I think the earliest thing that I can really remember is just the disconnect with my father. My father wasn't there enough for me, that he didn't care for me, that he didn't love me because the time uh, was a factor and he didn't spend that with me. I, I started noticing at, at that age, 13, 14, 15, my attraction towards other guys. And uh, as they had prayed for me, the father of this individual that had come to lead worship that night, he said, I have a word from the Lord for you. And he said, you are going to be the next torchbearer. Welcome to Pure Passion. I'm Jonathan Darty, your host for today's program. It's been the experience in the near quarter century life of Mastering Life Ministries, the producer of this program, that the vast majority of males who struggle with homosexual confusion did not have the emotional connection with their father that every boy needs. You may hear the opposite story being told by activists on talk shows, but with them there's an important difference. In addition to their advocacy role that often demands exaggeration or dishonesty, most of them haven't been through a deep Christian-based recovery process where such a discovery occurs by the leading of the Holy Spirit. As you will see with today's guest, a child is often unaware of the emotional disconnect with his father because it's all he's ever known, and it seems normal to him. There can also be internal family pressure to protect the family image at any cost, which is very common in dysfunctional family systems. It should also be said that homosexual confusion is usually not the result of one factor. It's a conspiracy of factors that can include such things as being emotionally unaffirmed by the same-sex parent, being sexually abused by anyone, being emasculated, humiliated, or unduly pressured by the opposite sex parent, having an overly sensitive temperament that reacts more severely to taunting and rejection by peers of either gender, having an experience that instills fear of the opposite sex, or any of a myriad of other contributing factors. In short, it's complicated. So listen carefully as Ron Smith describes the multiplicity of factors that led to his homosexual confusion. My uh, earliest recollection of childhood uh, would have to be dealing with the church. My, my mom and dad, uh, were uh, Salvation Army officers with the Salvation Army. So I was raised in the church uh, from the time that I was born. We would always go. My dad was a preacher. My mom was a preacher. So church was part of life for me. Um, I think the earliest thing that I can really remember is just the disconnect with my father. It was difficult for me. Dad was so busy doing the things that the church required of him that oftentimes I felt as if he didn't have time for me. One of my greatest love languages is time. And uh, it took a long time for me to figure that out, but it is. And uh, uh, so growing up uh, was good. Parents were great. They, you know, they did what they could do as a parent. But for me, my perception was that my father wasn't there enough for me, that he didn't care for me, that he didn't love me because the time uh, was a factor and he didn't spend that with me. So uh, we also, during the course of my childhood, moved about every three to four years. So for me, peer-to-peer -peer contact and peer-to-peer -peer relationship was very difficult for me. I'm a quiet guy, kind of introverted in the way that I think, in the way that I feel. And so it was difficult for me to make new friends. And I knew as we, were going to, as we would move from place to place to place that I would um, eventually move. And so I thought, well, what's the point? Why do I want to make connections with these people when I'm just going to move again in a few years? So with the disconnect with my dad and the disconnect with peers, um, I just kind of became this introverted thing. Books became my favorite outlet. I loved to read. And I could spend hours in my room reading. And I didn't really know at the time, but I was really setting myself up for some really uh, bad social disconnects. Um, I could be... Uh, a social butterfly if I had to. I knew that in church settings and in those contexts that it was required that I be able to be able to network and inter intermingle with people. 
Uh, but I could do that, but then as soon as I would leave that situation, it was pretty much back to the shutdown and I would never push in or push out to uh, extend myself socially. I did what was required and then I would kind of shut down. So for me, it became this, this thing of being shut down uh, socially, shut down emotionally. Um, I didn't feel like I had to push in to, to gain social relationship, to gain emotional connection with other guys and other peers, with my dad. So it just became a place for me of just being shut down all the way around. Um, and I didn't, I didn't realize that this is what was going on, that this is what I was doing. When I entered high school, um, I just, I was in band, so we had that as a social outlet, and I thought I was doing okay, but I, I started noticing at, at that age, 13, 14, 15, my attraction towards other guys. Um, I, didn't, I didn't connect it in a, in a sexual manner. I just all thought, oh wow, I like the way that he does this, or I like the way that he handles that, or you know, he's pretty muscular, wow, I wonder, does he work out? And, and I began to um, just see these other guys, and, and they became greater, and I became lesser. My self-esteem began to weaken more and more and more as I, as I fantasized about being connected with these guys or actually being that particular individual. And uh, this progressed all the way through high school. Uh, and then in, in the place of being emotionally shut down, along with that, it was this huge disconnect with, with how I perceived myself and what I, uh, the relational development that should happen there. Um, but the manifestation, I think, for the actual same-sex attraction, the step off into homosexuality, happened for me at the age of 17. Uh, when I was spending the night at a friend's house and uh, this sexual encounter just kind of happened. It was one of those things that just developed. And um, it took me by surprise. Uh, but at the same point in time, it was like, oh, this is what I'm lacking. This is what I just kind of had a big connection uh, with this experience that had just happened. Um, and it filled something in me, but at the same time, it pulled something out of me. So it put me in this uh, dichotomous position of, of a push-pull situation. So I really wasn't sure about all of it, but I knew that what had just happened was something that I liked and something that I enjoyed. Uh, I never connected it with being gay or being homosexual yet. Uh, this was kind of the early 80s kind of a thing. So uh, shortly after high school, uh, we moved again and I finished high school and started into community college uh, in our new home in Florida. And when I started community college, of course, at that level, you have people that are coming out of high school and all the way up through, because you have adults that are now attending school and adults getting their ongoing education and stuff. And I began to understand that these feelings and emotions and the things that I was going through were connected with the gay lifestyle and being homosexual. So that's where the connect was made uh, with the gay identity. I'd like to tell you why it's important to know the character of God. Some of the people we try to help have got such a distorted view of the nature of God that they have gone off into all sorts of different behaviors which have been really ungodly and they've really struggled in life. Let me explain. I'll never forget the man who had all sorts of different sexual relationships and he was looking for comfort and he had no concept that God actually could be the source of comfort in his life. He was brought up by a human father who was cruel, who was hard, who was never there for him, and he looked for comfort in all the wrong places. He never had the experience of a father who put his arms around him, who loved him, who showed him what love is really like. And so as he grew up through his teenage, teenage years, he began to look, as many people do, for love in all the wrong places. When I began to pray with him and to help him to see why he'd gone off into all these different behaviors, 
he began to weep over the loss of his fathering. You know, one of the things that it says in the scripture is that Jesus came to show us what the father is really like. And children are meant under God to actually understand the nature and the character of God from their human fathers. So if their human fathers are absent or cruel or hard, they get an understanding in their heart that that's what God's like as well. And it's very hard to relate to someone and to receive love from someone that you actually don't think loves you. You don't think cares for you. You don't think has any time for you. So when we're actually praying with people who've got issues to do with fathering, we often see that there are consequences in their lives that they've been living out in the years that followed. You know, when Jesus came and he showed us compassion, he showed us love, he showed us healing, he showed us the expression of all that a father is, he was actually giving us a clear understanding of the nature and the character of God. And one of the most profound things that we found in bringing people to healing is to help them to understand that God really is a God of love. He didn't just choose to love you, he is love. You know, one of the most scary bits of misunderstanding of scripture is that people think, well, God decided to love me. And if you have that belief, you then have a problem because God could decide not to love you. And how can you trust someone who you don't know whether or not they're going to love you today or tomorrow? See, the character of God is love. He can't do anything else but love. And in his love, he desires to show us his character so that we could come into his presence and receive the healing that the compassionate love of Father God wants to bring into each one of our hearts. That man I told you about was able to forgive his human father for all the things he'd suffered and then to turn his attention and his spirit to the nature and the character of God as he really is and respond to God's love. And as the love of God came into his heart, he received comfort on the inside. He realized he didn't need to go off after all sorts of other relationships. He was actually receiving comfort, receiving love, receiving compassion and receiving healing, which meant he could then in his life, day by day, step by step, rebuild his life, bring his life into godly order. And with his life in godly order, he was then able to actually become the person that God intended him to be. Knowing the character and the nature of God is really important. Shortly after that, I was 18 and I met a gentleman at the school. Uh, he was in the theater department and I just was one of those people that you just idolize. He was very talented, played the piano, sing, danced, act, just the whole thing. And he took an interest in me. Uh, we started hanging out together and I developed a crush on this individual. Well, the crush turned, uh, was reciprocated and it turned into a full-blown relationship. Um, and I actually, at the age of 19, left home and moved in with this individual. He had a maturity about him that I was drawn to, and he was also very talented, and he was good with people. He was theatrical. So all these areas that I felt myself weak in or uh, unable to connect with, he was those things. And so by, by the fact that he was showing attention to me, it made me feel better about myself, and, and my self-esteem uh, became connected with his treatment of me. Uh, now we would call that a codependent relationship or an emotional dependency. Uh, I became extremely emotional dependent on this individual. So um, as I moved in with him and as our relationship uh, developed, um, the relationship lasted a total of almost 18 years. Uh, and I became extremely emotionally dependent upon this individual. But added into this mix, was the fact that both of us had been raised in a Christian household. So both of us knew at some level that the sexual part of our relationship uh, was not what God had intended for people. Um, but we couldn't, we couldn't distinguish that from the rest of our relationship. We, there was no, it was very difficult. We had a, a God void that was within us. And we would talk about it, and both of us knew that we couldn't have the God void filled 
and maintain this kind of a relationship. The two didn't coincide with one another. So often during the course of this 18 years, uh, we would call it quits uh, in, in that aspect of the relationship and would actually move into separate parts of the house. Uh, and we would start going to church and become active in the church, um, looking for that um, connect with God and that, um, that affirmation, I think. But because we had each other and because of the, the dependency levels of the relationship, we never really pushed out past that. We didn't join Bible studies or men's groups or anything like that. It was kind of like, we'll go to church on Sunday morning and once in a while on Sunday night. And that was kind of the extent of, of our interaction with church. I could tell that there was, there was a lot of animosity towards people that were gay or, you know, because things that were being said with, by members of the congregation, the, the gay slur jokes, you know, words like faggot and stuff like where we would hear them, you know, in the course of our Sunday morning visits. Um, and so it was like, well, I don't know how we're going to connect these two, but somehow or another, the draw for, for that God connect was there. And so we kept kind of just pushing forward with it. Uh, that ended for me uh, about four years into all of that uh, because from the pulpit, it was in the early 80s. Um, AIDS was coming onto the scene. People didn't understand it. Uh, the church didn't understand it. Uh, people were scared. There was a lot of stuff going on. It, was, it became the scourge of God or the plague of God to wipe out the gay community. And, and the church kind of made it, it's, this particular one kind of made it the, the the banner or the mantra that, you know, this is going to wipe out all of those people that God can't receive. And, and uh, so one Sunday morning, um, the pastor used the, the um, first Corinthians six, nine and 10. And in that list, Paul gives this whole list of people, liars and cheats and um, people that have adultery and, and, and homosexuality is listed in that list. And, and he goes on to say that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the pastor went on and he, he kind of left everybody else out of that whole list. And he narrowed in on just the people that were homosexual and went on this 15 minute um, rant about how, you know, homosexuals were not going to inherit the kingdom of God and that they were all hellbound. There was no distinguishing between the behavior and the person. It was the, the label homosexual was just attached as a big, like a rubber stamp had been placed. Um, there was no verse 11. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11 talks about such were some of you, mentioning everybody in that list and how everybody within the Corinthian church had an issue, whatever that issue was, whether they were a liar or whether they were a homosexual, it didn't matter. What, what mattered was that people used to live that way. But because the Christ had been crucified and risen again, that we can now have that as our redemption and then we are made washed clean when we believe that. And that was never part of that whole picture. It was never brought into context that, that there was hope. So I actually left that church that day hopeless and, and angry. But God wasn't finished with me. I know uh, what it's like to be in a long-term relationship. I know that there's no such thing as monogamy within a gay relationship. I mean, for all intents and purposes, we were married. We had a house together. We had cars together, everything. When we would hang out together, people would refer to us as a single person. God started doing what I call breaking the spokes of the wheel in my life about 17 years into the relationship. Um, things were going on for me. I lost my job. Uh, the relationship wasn't going well. It was difficult to try to maintain a relationship when you're both depleted in the same manner and you're expecting that other person to fill in that depletedness from you um, or for you. And I was becoming more and more promiscuous and more and more out there and more and more militant about my lifestyle choice and what was going on. And uh, we were both uh, in an emotional, distressed place at this point. But we both knew that God was doing something in our lives. And we both knew that this was, this was something that we had to do. 
And so I said goodbye to my partner. It was 12 years ago. And uh, my life has not been the same ever since. As I was reading this book, Coming Out of Homosexuality, they write about a live-in program that was in San Rafael uh, called uh, New Hope. And I just had this sense in my spirit that, that that's where I was going to wind up at. And I was just kind of taken back and I thought, well, okay, God, if this is what you're telling me to do, then you need to tell my dad. I'm not going to tell my dad that you're sending me to California and especially this place, San Rafael. Where is that? I looked it up on the map and I said, that's 15 miles outside of San Francisco. No way am I telling my dad that, you know, you tell him. Uh, the Holy Spirit did, told my father. And um, so I called uh, New Hope Ministries and I came out and um, beginning of July and I uh, visited the program for a weekend and I thought, oh, this is so great. I mean, I was suddenly in a household of 30 other guys that all knew what I was going through, uh, that all knew what it was like to be walking this journey. And they were all over the place in their journey. Some just leaving, some been struggling for years and it was just neat. And um, I got to meet Frank Worthen um, because it was his ministry. And, I remember walking into his office and he was coming out of his office and I just kind of ran into him. Uh, and I just hugged his neck and I said, thank you uh, for what you're doing. Uh, thank you. We would have these nights of praise and worship. Uh, we would meet together in this room in the house and Frank would play the piano and we would sing and we would pray for one another and cite scripture. Well, on this particular night, there was some guest musicians that were there and she had brought along her father and uh, we were praying for people uh, on what we called the hot seat, which was a long uh, coffee table that sat in the middle of the room. And we would sit on the end of the coffee table and people would rally around us and lay hands and pray for us and what was happening and going on. And so they set me on the end of this coffee table and people gathered around and they were laying their hands on and praying for me. And uh, mind you, I had just been out of the lifestyle maybe nine months. And uh, as they had prayed for me, the father of this individual that had come to lead worship that night, he said, I have a word from the Lord for you. And he said, you are gonna be the next torchbearer. And that's all he said. I did some ministry with Frank. I went to Manila with him in 2004. There's a, our sister ministry, Bagong Bagasa is there. Uh, and I went with him to, to do some leadership and training classes. And then in 2005, I went to Quito, Ecuador to help, uh, to help with an Exodus conference that they were having in South America. So God was beginning to bestow the mantle of leadership on me uh, as I was walking through this. One day, Frank called me into his office and he's like, you know, I'm getting a little bit older and I'm losing my eyesight and I'm losing my hearing. And he said, I've been talking to the board and he said, we think that we would like to make you director of New Hope. And um, I was like, wow, yeah, the torchbearer. And so the prophecy that was given nine years previous um, came true on April the 9th, 2009. I've had the ministry for two and a half years now. Um, loving every minute of it. God never ceases to um, amaze me uh, in my life within the life of the church, but especially within the life of the guys that, that he's brought into my life for me to shepherd. While I struggle with same-sex attraction at some level, I no longer identify myself as a gay man. I don't identify with that community. I identify with my Christian community and what Christ has done for me in living out a life as a redeemed individual. I see those as two very different things. I don't make heterosexuality my goal. My goal is righteousness, it's wholeness. It's living the life that God has called me to live. Now it's not about having sex with that man to make it okay. It's about connecting with that man in a healthy manner and in a healthy level and drawing from him in that manner. As he affirms everything that I'm going through is a natural process of just being a man. And so now my relationship with my heavenly father is very, very well connected, as is the relationship with my earthly father. It's enabled me to connect with him as well. Would you like to connect with your heavenly father at a deeper level 
and receive those things that went missing in your childhood? You can, you know. First, you need to connect with his son, Jesus Christ, because Jesus himself said that no one could come to the Father except through him. Why? Because it was Jesus who paved the way for restoration with God the Father by dying on the cross and paying the penalty for your sins. His sacrifice will enable your spirit to come alive to the Father so that fellowship will be possible. After making the decision to turn from sin to follow Christ, you can then approach God the Father and ask Him to reveal your uniquely broken path and the way it can be healed. More than healing though, God will empower you as you partner with Him to walk in holiness. As He reveals Himself to you in prayer and while singing His praises, He will transform your affections and give you new desires. The old will pass away and you will be transformed into a new creation on multiple levels. Until next week, I'm Jonathan Darty for Pure Passion.